Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Really glad you're with us for the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Sorry, no good martini today, but we've got a lot of bad and crazy stuff to talk about. And most of it, of course, deals with uh, Afghanistan once again. Uh, For the first time in the past week when uh, all of this was really hitting the fan, President Biden is actually taking questions. No, not live uh, and not from an entire press corps, but just from George Stephanopoulos, as we said yesterday. Even with the excerpts ABC is giving us, we're getting uh, a pretty lousy performance from Joe Biden here. First of all, as far as I can tell, his only actual skill or quality uh, in politics or anywhere else is his empathy. And for some reason, it's just completely gone in this case. Here's uh, his reaction to uh, Stephanopoulos talking about those horrific scenes we saw at the Kabul airport on Monday. We've all seen the pictures. We've seen those hundreds of people packed into a C-17. We've seen... Afghans falling. That was four days ago, five days ago. Wow, a lot of compassion there. That was, first of all, it wasn't. It was two days earlier, not four or five, but uh, not exactly the response you'd expect from the person who supposedly is known for his decency. Uh, But then there was, Jim, I think this is probably the worst part of what they released, and that's uh, Stephanopoulos asking Biden, are you saying that this uh, couldn't have been done any better? So you don't think this could have been handled? This actually could have been handled better in any way? No mistakes? No, I, I, I don't think it could have been handled in a way that there, we, we're going to go back in hindsight and look, but the idea that somehow there's a way to have gotten out without chaos ensuing, I don't know how that happens. I don't know how that happened. So for you, that was always priced into the decision? Yes. I think it could have been a little less chaotic if we got our people out and the people that helped us out uh, before we uh, pulled up, pulled the military out. But anyway, uh, Jim, then there was this. Uh, first of all, he was being asked this, I think, in reaction to Secretary of Defense Austin giving word salad about how long we'll stay and we'll, whether we'll stay past August 31st if we still have Americans there. So Stephanopoulos brought it up to Biden and he got to the right point. But man, was it torturous. And are you committed to making sure that the troops stay until every American who wants to be out yes. is out? Yes. How about our Afghan allies? We have about 80,000 people. Well, who, that's not the Is estimate. that too high? That's too high. How the many? estimate we're giving is somewhere between 50 and 65,000 folks total, counting their families. Does the commitment hold for them as well? The commitment holds to get everyone out that, in fact, we can get out and everyone that should come out. And that's the objective. That's what we're doing now. That's the path we're on. And I think we'll get there. So Americans should understand that troops might have to be there beyond August 31st. No, Americans should understand that we're going to try to get it done before August 31st. But if we don't, the troops will stay. If we don't, we'll determine at the time who's left. And? And if if there's American citizens left, we're going to stay till we get them all out. Of course, one of the reasons it's hard for them to commit to this, Jim, is because they can't actually get people to the airport uh, to get them out. They can get them out if they can get to the airport. But uh, you had a lot to say in the morning jolt about Biden's performance uh, in this interview, and none of it was good. Indeed, Greg. And it seems like they're getting a very strong reaction to this so far um, and not in the Jim, no, you're crazy. How could you possibly think that? The, the simple headline is there's something wrong with the president. And I think the fact that he has barely appeared for the past week, uh, his two pub- two of his three public appearances were reading 20- a speech off a teleprompter for 20 minutes and not taking any questions. And yesterday's interview with Stephanopoulos is the only time he has taken questions in the past week. And by the way, I guess if we're looking for a silver lining to this bad martini, I think you can say that George Stephanopoulos asked just about all the questions he was supposed to ask. He did not necessarily serve up softballs. Like I'm sure there are you know, listeners out there who could say, oh, I wish he'd you know, phrased it this way, or I forget. I, I think he asked, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd give him a pass, Stephanopoulos, a passing grade on this. Uh, I think the president was disastrous. And I really am not sure the president, like we've been saying Biden's old for a very long time. We've been saying Biden, ah, you know, he's not who he was. When he was vice presidency, he's getting up in the years. And John Ellis had this very sharp observation. He says that you're allowed to say it in public if you if you put it in the softest possible terms. Like he's lost a little speed off his fastball or he's lost a step or two or something. You can't say the president is really old and he's not there, not all there anymore. But that interview 
there was something weird and just disconnected. He, he really seemed indignant that Stephanopoulos had asked him about the images of the crowded American plains and the Afghans falling from there. The issue is less the number of days it was ago, you know, two versus four or five. The bigger thing is just like, he seemed like it was ancient history. Like, why on earth would you ask about that? Well, well, you know, first of all, it wasn't that long. Even if it was four or five days ago, it's still an important thing, Mr. President. You haven't been available. You haven't been seen. This is the first chance anyone's had and to ask you about this sort of thing. Um, as I went through the morning, Joel, nothing he said yesterday can be can square with what he said on July 8th. And he can, in fact, there are several times where he was insisting he said the opposite of what he said on July 8th. He said he had predicted that the Taliban would take over. That is exactly not what he said. He said that there was no, you know, uh, almost no chance of the Taliban taking over. Um, he was asked about the intelligence and uh, Biden said the intelligence was cloudy, um, that it was, uh, it was, you know, there was no consensus. Well, in that July 8th press conference, Biden said, um, that it was not true that the intelligence committee had assessed the Afghan government would likely collapse. Uh, you know, he, he, it was almost gaslighting. It was almost like him insisting that he had said stuff. So there's one of two things. Either he's a really shameless and bad liar, which is bad, or the other scenario, which I think is really true. Oh, the one other detail that kind of jumps out at me is Stephanopoulos asked, you know, your military advisors were recommending that you, sp- you know, keep 2,500 troops in the country. Um, and what was then really unnerving and weird uh, is that Biden insisted, no, they didn't. That wasn't true. That wasn't true. Um, and then Stephanopoulos says, didn't they ask you they wanted troops to stay? And he said, not in terms of whether we got it all in a time frame of troops. They didn't argue against that. So Stephanopoulos, for the third time, really wanted to pin him down. To say, so no one told you, no, we should just keep 2,500 troops. It's been a stable situation for the last several years. We can do that. We can continue to do that. Biden said, no one said that to me that I can recall. So one possibility is that everybody at the Pentagon is lying and that they never warned President Biden. Another possibility is that Biden is lying. But I think the scenario that I think is like not getting enough potential attention there, Greg, is that I think Biden might genuinely not remember what was said in these briefings a few months ago. I'm not sure that he's lying. I, I think he may genuinely have no memory of what he's uh he's being told so this is just a top to bottom depressing dispiriting presentation um biden is in office but he's not there so to speak, the lights are on but nobody's home this this is a really unnerving uh set of circumstances he, his description of things on the ground was just not in keeping with the videos we're seeing from kabul um he just does not seem connected to anything right now and I don't know if you'll see conversation of the 25th Amendment. We talked about how extraordinarily unlikely that is yesterday. But I think the evidence is mounting that there's something wrong with President Biden. And that's why he's not, you know, he doesn't do interviews because he can't. Because he can't do it without, you know, getting himself in enormous trouble, without coming across as a man who has no idea of what's going on and who contradicts things he said just a short while ago. He's really in trouble. And, I, you know, I, I, I think we're kind of in uncharted waters here, Greg. Yeah, it uh, it certainly seems that way. I mean, we had Woodrow Wilson incapacitated from that stroke over 100 years ago, and his wife seemed to be handling a lot of his duties. But uh, because of his physical ailments, they really couldn't even trot him out in public. And back then, of course, you had no radio, much less TV. And so you could hide that sort of thing. You could hide the fact that FDR couldn't walk and, and things like that. But uh, uh, And I don't know what Wilson's mental state was at that point, but uh, – to be in the information age now and uh, watch this type of uh, performance from the president and, and no real answers coming from the administration is very interesting. I'm sure that uh, anybody who suggests that out loud in the briefing room or anywhere else is going to uh, be accused of all sorts of horrible things. But uh, I mean, people. The last person who suggested that was Julian Castro, and never, no one ever saw him ever again. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, in a very strange way, I wonder if Julian Castro feels kind of vindicated that that you know, like we're we're seeing you know, we, you know, Biden had said something that was a mild contradiction, and Castro jumped on it during one of the debates and said, "Can't you remember what you said?" You know, it was very clearly going after Biden's age and, and memory, and people thought it was out of line. But I am not, and, and probably it was out of line in that particular circumstance. Castro picked a bad example, but everyone could see the Joe Biden of 2019 was not the guy we were used to seeing on our screens, our television screens in 2016. And, you know, age had caught up with him. And we are now seeing that in the Oval Office, assuming Biden never goes back to the White House, because apparently he's going back to Delaware today. 
Bowls. Yes. Nothing can interrupt the vacation, Jim. And, of course, uh, if you're right, uh, then they certainly want him out of the public eye as much as possible. But they haven't. Uh, we haven't seen the vice president either, which is kind of interesting. Uh, apparently, she doesn't want to be tied to this, even though she was bragging about being the last person in the room uh, when he made the decision to fully withdraw. But uh, anyway, if you need a break, you need a mental health check, <laughs> Can't blame me if you do. Uh, Headspace could be uh, a good way to do that. Wouldn't it be great if there were a pocket-sized guide that could help you sleep, focus, and just uh, have a better day? Well, there is. And if you have 10 minutes, Headspace can make a really big difference. Headspace is your daily dose of mindfulness in the form of guided meditations and an easy-to-use app. Headspace is one of the only meditation apps that is advancing the field of mindfulness and meditation through clinically validated research. So whatever the situation, Headspace really can help you feel better. Overwhelmed? Headspace has a three-minute SOS meditation for you. Probably lots of people all around the world feeling overwhelmed right now. Do you need some help falling asleep? Headspace has wind-down sessions that their members swear by. And for parents, Headspace even has morning meditations you can do with your kids. Headspace's approach to mindfulness can reduce stress, improve sleep, boost focus, and increase your overall sense of well-being. And as we've said many times here, um, our chief operations officer says uh, a number of our hosts here at the Radio America have used uh, Headspace, particularly over the past uh, year and a half with all the stress and the pandemic. Uh, they found that they focus better, they, they sleep better, and they perform better. Headspace is backed by 25 published studies on its benefits, 600,000 five-star reviews, and more than 60 million downloads. You deserve to feel happier, and Headspace is meditation made simple. Go to headspace.com slash martini. That's headspace.com slash martini for a free one-month trial with access to headspace's full library of meditations for every situation it's the best deal that headspace has going right now so head to headspace.com slash martini today all right jim let's move to our first crazy martini and for that we had this is a double-fisted crazy martini by the way and that's how the left they really can't defend biden so instead they're doing this insane thing of trying to compare the taliban with conservatives, and they're doing it in a couple of different ways. First of all, this is Stephen Colbert on the uh, whatever used to be the Letterman show, the late show on CBS, and uh, he's uh, comparing the Taliban with uh, the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th. We have had troops there for 20 years. They fought. They sacrificed. Their families sacrificed so that we wouldn't have a terrorist attack in America planned in a foreign country. Why should our soldiers be fighting radicals in a civil war in Afghanistan? We've got our own on Capitol Hill. Jim, you and I have not downplayed the significance of what happened on uh, January 6th. It was awful. If the parties were reversed in the whole situation, and a lot of Democrats did that when a Republican was about to be certified as the next president of the United States, I think the reaction on the right would be quite a bit different. And it would be very different on the left as well, mind you. But this is like uh, the people a a few months ago who were saying that January 6th was worse than 9-11. Please. Absolutely insane. January 6th, bad day. Nowhere close to what happened on 9-11 and nowhere close to what's happening with the Taliban here. But uh, that hasn't stopped Dean Obadala, uh, an opinion columnist over at MSNBC, for comparing uh, conservatives to the Taliban. His headline, Afghan women's rights are threatened, but the GOP isn't their champion. The subhead, the Taliban aren't the only ones trying to impose their will on women's bodies and choices. He starts with a bill that... uh, Uh, was signed into law in Arkansas uh, that uh, bans uh, abortions even in the case of rape. Uh, It also eventually devolves into uh, the efforts to uh, overturn Roe v. Wade. So that's clearly the same as what the Taliban does to women. And uh, he even gets to the point of uh, talking about Republicans being opposed to the Paycheck Fairness Act that the Democrats are rolling on Capitol Hill. So I guess if you're opposed to the Democratic agenda that uh, at least tangentially involves women, you're like the Taliban, Jim. And so uh, when you get that crazy, nobody should listen to you. Yeah, I mean, we, we could say, you know, oh, these people are being ridiculous, and they are, but I think it actually, they're re- inadvertently revealing a great deal about how they see the world. Greg, in this podcast, you and I will make fun of a lot of Democrats, we'll make fun of a lot of liberals. We, we you know, enjoy it. We relish it. We both think they have it, deserve it, and have it coming. And there's a great deal of Christmas. There, there are people, there are American citizens who I'm really, really uh, sometimes even livid with, right? I think Andrew Cuomo comes to mind. I think Harvey Weinstein ranks as one of the great monsters of our time. 
Um, the fact that I call our governor, Governor Blackface, should give you a sense of what I think of our current governor. But all of these people on their worst day are in a different category than the Taliban and Al Qaeda and ISIS and other foreign enemies of this country whose goal in life is to kill Americans. Right now, you can insert jokes about the nursing homes here. Uh, but in the end, Andrew Cuomo is not someone who is trying to commit terrorist attacks against Americans and blow them to pieces. Harvey Weinstein does not necessarily want to do that, even if he is the scum of the earth and uh, a, a you know sexual predator. Um, Northam is shameless and embarrassing and makes these ludicrous excuses and, and all that kind of stuff. But he's just that's just a different category. And if you can't draw those distinctions. Uh, I think there's something very wrong with your worldview. I think in the end, you are so enraged and incapable of keeping perspective about your domestic opponents. And I use that word opponents, not enemies, that you really, you have no anger left over for foreign enemies who represent true evil. And there was a comment by Avi Wolf yesterday that, you know, stuck with me. Um, it was contrasting how Biden had really ripped into GOP governors for their masking stuff compared to his relatively milquetoast statement about the Taliban. And Avi had said something like, the ruling class only knows how to punch down against the domestic outgroup, against anyone else it folds. And there is something to that, that in the end, I, it would be fascinating to see, you know, will the Taliban be concerned about international opinion as it returns to the Tal? No, <laughs> right. the Taliban does not care about tweets. The Taliban does not care about bad press. The Taliban does not care about... Uh, it's long-term economic prospects, you know, like the Taliban has its value set. And I really do think there's a big chunk of the progressive Democrat uh, foreign policy leadership crew that really just can't get their heads around it. In the end, the heart of it is that they mirror. Uh, they look at somebody from a foreign culture and despite all of their talk about multiculturalism and all of their summers abroad in Paris and all their talk about how they appreciate, they don't really understand how foreign cultures work. And they think that the people in other countries must be motivated by the same things that motivate them. Oh, by the way, I think they think other Americans are motivated by the same things that motivate them. That's not necessarily the case either. But anyway, so in all of this, like we can go, oh, my God, they're just being ridiculous. But I think it also indicates these are people who, in the end, don't really have that much animus left over for the Taliban or Al Qaeda or ISIS or whatever damned Islamic terrorist group is going to rise in the next 10 years. Uh, I think what is extremely like in the end, they only know how to hate Republicans. They only know how to hate conservatives. They only know how to hate their fellow countrymen, um, because I think contemplate you know, in the end, like you know, the the you know the January six protesters were, were bad people. Bad people. I don't buy I don't buy any of this excuse that they're just misguided patriots or something like that. Apparently, they were smearing feces on the walls. I'm sorry. At that point, you're not at the halls of Congress. Sorry, you're not a good person at that point. Right? This is not an innocent misunderstanding about a velvet rope line or something like that. They're bad people, but they're not ISIS. They're not Al Qaeda. They're not Taliban. And the fact that people can't draw those kinds of distinctions, I think in the end says they're much more comfortable fighting po domestic political enemies than the people who are the genuine enemies of this country. Amazing. Yeah, I haven't heard anything from the squad about how horrified they are that the Taliban's back in uh, power yet. So. They have no problem when it comes to uh, immediately attacking Republicans. But uh, anyway, let's talk about something a little bit happier and that uh, it's back to school time. Hopefully it'll look somewhat normal where you live. Uh, in a lot of places, obviously, there's still going to be some uh, different type of policies in place. But uh, when it comes to college students and those who have recently been to college, there's also the issue of paying for that. Even if you're long done with the classes, you got to pay those student loan bills. And so it's time to break out of the student debt cycle. And Ernest can help you by refinancing that student loan. And times are tough. Now you got inflation happening right now. You got interest rates possibly rising at some point. And worrying about your student loan payments doesn't make things any easier. And that's why refinancing with Ernest can help. So just say goodbye to stressful student loan payments and take charge of your future with Ernest. Ernest offers low rate student loan refinancing. You can check your rate risk free in just two minutes. With Ernest, you get radically flexible payments and you can pick your loan term. And by refinancing, you can reduce your loan term, save money, or combine multiple loans to a simple monthly payment. And if you have questions, you can even talk to a real live human being at Ernest for help. Now, isn't it time you stopped feeling overwhelmed by your student debt? 
Now's a great time to do it. Ernest is giving Three Martini Lunch listeners a $100 bonus. Refinance your student loans at earnest.com slash martini. Terms and conditions do apply. Once again, you get a $100 cash bonus when you visit earnest.com slash martini to refinance your student loan. It is not available in all states, and terms and conditions apply. And we also have a little bit of legal from Ernest to pass along to you. Ernest Student Loan Refinancing made by Ernest Operations, LLC, NMLS, number 1204917, California Financing Law, license number 6054788, 535 Mission Street, San Francisco, California, 94105. Visit Ernest.com slash licenses for a full list of licenses. All right, Jim, let's move on to our second bad or second crazy or maybe both. Uh, Britain is our special relationship, right? Special friendship. Uh, we're tight on so many different things. I, in recent memory, uh, the Bush-Blair alliance in the wake of 9-11 and in Iraq certainly uh, highlighted that. Um, the controversy over Iraq probably pulled the countries apart a little bit. And then we watched Britain go through Brexit. But uh, now, of course, the Boris Johnson is the prime minister. And that's the one phone call, maybe two now, that Biden's made since all this uh, collapse in Afghanistan. You mentioned in the jolt that he's talked to Angela Merkel as well. But uh, the Brits are furious about what's happening here. Uh, Ed Morrissey over at Hot Air talking about how Parliament and uh, other members of the British government absolutely livid with um, how our handling of the withdrawal in Afghanistan went. Uh, there was a uh, very uh, dramatic speech on the floor by uh, Member of Parliament Tom Tugendhat, if that's how you say it. And um, the parliament has actually held the president in contempt. The MPs and uh, peers, according to uh, tweets from the UK, unite to condemn, quote, dishonor of U.S. president's withdrawal and his criticism of Afghan troops left behind to face the Taliban. And so uh, Boris Johnson is also taking a lot of heat uh, for what they call the worst disaster in British foreign policy in 65 years, saying the prime minister was not doing enough to rally allies Uh, to support Afghanistan as the U.S. departure became apparent. And so um, headlines in the U.K. include MPs condemn Biden over shameful U.S. withdrawal, MPs lambast Johnson over Afghanistan humiliation, uh, and on and on it goes. But uh, usually these things between allies that are this close are done a little bit more, you know, away from the cameras. But, uh, Jim, uh, fury, frustration, and rage coming from perhaps our closest ally. Yeah, and it's worth remembering this was the president who, who, you know, almost immediately after taking office, started starting around and saying, America is back, you know, and, and, and boasting and being so proud, you know, that we'd restored our good name. You know, um, that is not the case. Uh, you know, uh, tell it to the, the women and children of Afghanistan that America is back. Right. Um, but focusing just on the, the quote unquote special relationship, what should be ultimately the easiest foreign relationship to to manage um, probably the most disturbing detail from Ben Riley Smith of the Daily Telegraph is when he says, report, quote, Mr. Johnson had been attempting to get Biden on the phone to discuss Kabul falling from Monday morning. The pair eventually talked at close to 10 p.m. on Tuesday. And bring our podcast full circle. What is the president doing all day? Is he, you know, like we know it's not talking to foreign leaders. We know he's not talking to the American public. What's he doing? You know, there are 24 hours in a day. Let's assume that he's sleeping eight. That's 16 hours. And when the, you know, you'd like to think that, you know, whatever form of communication, whether it's through the embassies or through, uh, I don't know if there's necessarily a hotline, but some sort of, when the message comes through, Prime Minister Boris Johnson would like to speak to you as, as soon as possible to discuss the fall of Kabul. And it takes them nearly two days to get to, you know, I guess a day and a half to uh, get back to him. Really? What is going on in this White House? Um, it, it's this is one of those situations where I I really wish I could give a full throated defense of the president and say to the Brits, hey, sorry, guys, you know, our guys, right. Your guys are sadly, I think the Brits have every right to complain. I, it does seem like they've been treated shabbily, to use a term that you often find in the British press. Um, it sounds like there's been surprising little coordination with British forces on the ground in Kabul, which is very uncharacteristic of what. U.S. and U.K. military forces have been and up until now. The biggest uh, uh, dis, you know, dispute between the two forces was how you pronounce the word military. <laughs> they're convinced it's a, they're convinced it's a three syllable word. Um, <laughs> I, I offer this gallows humor because otherwise we would cry. I mean, if we can't if we can't get on the same page with the United Kingdom, what are our chances of getting along with, you know, uh, more challenging allies like India uh, or potential allies or things like that? 
Um, this is, and again, this is from a president who was supposed to be good at this. This was supposed to be um, uh, a, a, you know, the strength of the Biden presidency. This is supposed to be what he was good at. And one of the papers over there has this subheadline quote, you cannot coordinate an international response from the beach. I, you know, which is, I guess, the slamming uh, Johnson, but it also applies to Biden. We look asleep at the switch. We look um, like we've abandoned our allies. We look uh, like we simply don't care. And that's the exact opposite of what Biden had promised to deliver. Well, Jim, this is a question I don't know that we're in a position to answer. But if there's this poor of communication after Kabul fell, how much were the Brits in the dark and everybody else in the days leading up to it? I mean, we could see from the news reports that it was likely to happen, but we kept hearing that, no, 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 don't worry about it. Uh, even as late as uh, Thursday, uh, Kirby over at the Pentagon was saying that uh, there's no imminent danger to Kabul. And by the weekend, it was over. And so were we feeding the same line to our closest friends, even off camera? Hey, look, you know what? There are all kinds of lies you can tell, but none are more damaging than the one you tell yourself. You know, did, did, was ultimately at the end, this White House, this president, this administration convinced everything was going fine. And thus, not only did we fail to prepare our people, we failed to prepare our allies for what was happening. And now they're in, they're in deep doo-doo like we are in part because we're... <sighs> anyway, it, it's, it's a deeply depressing situation. You kind of wonder, like we were told that Trump was going to destroy all of our relationships with our allies. And uh, so far, Biden is being less than sterling at uh, what was supposed to be, what he was telling us was going to be the strength of his presidency. In so many ways that this is a disaster. So we talked about Taiwan, Ukraine, the Baltics, uh, certainly whether people can trust us again. One thing I've seen, Jim, at least in some reports, is that the Brits are finding ways to uh, actually get their people to the airport. Apparently they're able mm. to do it, but um, apparently it's too big of a, of a lift for us. But uh, Anyway, keep praying because uh, the days are the days are running out. We got twelve days left in August. I know we'll stay there hopefully until all Americans are gone and as many Afghan friends as we can get. But uh, uh, the days go quickly, and so uh, a lot needs to happen in that time. So until tomorrow, Jim, rest up. We'll do it again. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Do tell your friends about us as well. We're always grateful for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Those are hugely helpful to us. Uh, get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Thursday, and please join us on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Hi, it's Dana Lash, host of The Dana Show. Every day, I'm here to keep you up to speed on the most important stories and info that you need to know in your very busy life. And if you're always on the go and you want to stay connected, just download our daily podcast and take it with you. It's a great way to get up to speed on what you need to know and what legacy media may not be telling you. Visit DanaRadio.com and click on the podcast link or subscribe at iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts.